Well, good morning. How are you guys today? Amen. Um, I have great news. God is alive and well, and he's on the throne doing great things. And uh, real quick, um, Tracy Galloway, touchdown in Europe this morning after a 30-hour um, travel thing to meet with Juan, and today they are together in um, France going to preach the gospel throughout Europe for the next six weeks. And so the testimonies coming out of what has happened with them in Africa and all these places, what God is doing um, is incredible. And so I just want us church to be excited knowing that God really is moving. He is doing great and awesome things. And while there is the darkness is getting darker, that just makes the light get so much brighter. And the miracles and, and the the moves of God are getting more and more and more, and truly the best is yet to come. And so today as we worship the Lord, just remember that he is who he says he is, and he does what he says he's going to do. He is a faithful God. He is a good God. And uh, I'm excited to see what he's going to do today. Amen? All right, so we are going to worship God. Go ahead, guys.
Oh uh-huh. 
that He is good. His plans for your day. And just take a moment and just rest in that. That His plans for you are good. That He loves you. And He wants you to trust Him. It's Communion Sunday. Woohoo! And you might be saying, well, how come we didn't come up and take the elements? Well, because a woman of great wisdom suggested that we not have the children hold the juice for 10 minutes. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> yes, I am teachable. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yes, I am teachable. That is awesome, isn't it? Hey, I pay attention. Yay. Um, so today we celebrate Jesus's resurrection because it's Sunday. That's what church is about. Hallelujah. We celebrate, but we're also going to celebrate communion, which means we're going to participate in communion. Yeah. So just a few words about that way back in the day, way back in the day, 
Like in Old Testament times, the priests of the Jewish people would make sacrifices every single day. They would make sacrifices for themselves and for the people. And this was done so that um, as a way of dealing with the sin in people's lives. They did this by sprinkling, sacrificing an animal and sprinkling the blood of that animal on the altar and then those people's sins were forgiven and they could be in relationship with God. That's what that was all about. So this goes on for a couple of thousand years, yes, and the system wasn't really working. People became more focused on what they've been doing wrong than the relationship with God part. Some just gave up being in relationship altogether. But Jesus changed all that. Hebrews 7, 26 and 27 says, For such a high priest, it's talking about Jesus, for such a high priest was fitting for us, he who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and has become higher than the heavens, who does not need daily as those former high priests did to offer up sacrifices first for his own sins and then for the people's for he jesus did this once for all when he offered up himself jesus came died on the cross offered himself up once for all time for our sins so that we can be in relationship with god so Hebrews 9.11 says, but Christ came as high priest of the good things to come with the greater and the more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is not of this creation, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood, he entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. A lot of words there. However, not with animal blood, but with his own blood, Jesus paid the price for our sin. And eternal redemption, what is that? That's forever forgiveness. That is continuing forgiveness. Jesus came so that we could be in relationship with God without focusing so much on the stuff we do wrong. Celebrating communion is about remembering what Jesus did for us and how important what he did really is because it allows us to be in relationship with him. So let's come up and take the uh, cracker and the juice and then we'll uh, take it together.
couple of information was that those people being careful were in this week's reading. Yeah. So if you're doing the Bible reading plan, those are the as well as So from First Corinthians eleven, Paul says this. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, he took bread, Matthew. You had your bread? Okay. He took bread, broke it, and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So let's partake. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. So let's pray. Father God, we just thank you for this time of communion. We thank you for the opportunity to remember exactly what it is that you did for us, Lord, so that we could truly be in relationship with you, Lord, to be in continual relationship with you. So, Father God, we thank you for this time. I ask, Lord, your blessing on your people, and we all ask it in the name of Jesus. Jesus. Amen. Praise the Lord. Glory to God. I uh, I really appreciated that word, and I just want to stress that here is the thing, you know, one of the problems that I think we have, as Pastor Karen pointed it out, is we focus on the sin. It's not about the sin. He did away with the sin to be in relationship. It was God's plan from the beginning to be in a relationship with his people. Amen. We need to focus on the relationship, Amen. not the sin, especially not focusing on somebody else's sin. Amen. Praise God. Hey, we're going to get ready to give to the Lord today. So if you need an envelope, somebody hit the lights back there. If you need an envelope, put your hand up. We'll get you an envelope. And we ask that you uh, use the envelope for a cash offering. I just have a couple of things to tell you. Um, next Sunday is Family Sunday. It's also Mission Sunday, so I expect we'll have a... Uh, a mission report, and there seems to be a lot to report, all right? We, I, uh, I see Juan on a regular basis on Facebook and what's going on. Um, also, this Wednesday night, we, we, we canceled last Wednesday because we had some weather come in right at the time when we knew we couldn't get the driveway cleared in time. So uh, It'll resume this Wednesday at 7 o'clock, and then this Thursday is men's prayer, all right? And uh, so don't have dinner because you, uh, we'll have dinner here, and it's men's prayer. We missed it last month, so that's this coming Thursday. Next Sunday is Family Sunday. It's also Mission Sunday. Elder James will be in the pulpit next Sunday. Praise God. And uh, all right, let's get ready to give to the Lord. Father God, I thank you for the privilege of giving back to you what is yours. Father God, it's all yours. I pray, God, that you would do what only you can do. Take our tithes and offerings. Use them, Father God. Multiply them so that someone would receive the gift of salvation. And I ask and pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. When you uh, are done giving... 
Take a moment, stretch. All right. Get a water if you need to. Get ready to hear what uh, the Holy Spirit would say to you today. I had a water there. Glory to God. I wanted to, uh, I just wanted to um, update you on a couple of things. I uh, had opportunity to speak with our dear Stacy at length and also the opportunity to speak with Brother Gerard. So uh, Stacy, she uh, came home from the hospital, so she is home. What happened... Uh, as best as she can tell, is she uh, she began to to feel um, a pain in her hip, in her side, and so she uh, she started to actually limp as a result of it. And she was sitting down, and then all of a sudden, she went to get up, and she couldn't stand on on that leg because of the pain in her hip. So uh, Teddy took her to uh, to the urgent care, and they uh, they suggested that she go to the hospital. So she did. Well, what they found was, and this is what's interesting. Apparently, she had cracked her hip at some point, and it had begun to heal. So when they did the scans and they did the MRIs, they saw that it had begun begun to heal so she doesn't know when that happened she doesn't remember falling but it 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 was a problem now she is able to uh to stand she is walking with a walker um the hip is healing um and she uh should be back uh, with us shortly so that's she she obviously said she thanks the church for the prayers she uh and she misses everybody, and she said to greet you. Now, Brother Gerard, he was, um, he was in the hospital, and now he has moved since then to, um, to the rehab facility, Care One. So we are trusting God that he's on the mend. He had an issue with the, the foot where, he had his, where they had to uh, amputate his toe, 
uh, it, was, it had gotten infected. And again, he admitted to me as we prayed together that the Holy Spirit would give him wisdom that he didn't follow the, uh, the eating habits that he was supposed to follow as a result of his sugar. And so uh, he ended up there. He, he also had a couple of other issues. And uh, we trust that God is taking care of them, and they have moved him to rehab. So he misses everybody, and he asked me to greet everybody. So that's the update as best as I can tell you. Now, we also have added to the population of Byron Bay Christian Church, Samantha, Samantha Noel Calandrillo was born on Friday. Six pounds, eight ounces, and uh, um, Scott is, we believe, um, as, we, as I talk to you, bringing his bride and baby home, and so uh, that's why we don't see him here today, and so, so we uh, congratulate them. All right, I think that's it. I think you're up to date on everything. Last week, I, uh, I talked about some uh, time frames of some things that are going to take place uh, based on the book of Revelation, based on some of the things in the New Testament, based on the, the Daniel prophecy. And so what I wanted to do was just, and this is as best as I understand it, and if that changes, I'll let you know, all right? But... Um, Essentially, I don't know if you know this or not, but we are in the last days. But understand something. Remember what the Word of God says. The Word of God says that to God, a day is like a thousand years, a thousand years like a day, right? Well, if you think about that, the Bible, and I'm not going to get into it today, but I will down the road, but the Bible is very precise with regards to numbers. There are numbers in the, in, in the Bible, in God's plan, that repeat and that mean things. The number 40 is very significant in God's plan. The number 7 is significant in God's plan. The number 3 is significant in God's plan. And just for food for thought, when you... Take the word that we know in our English language as resurrection. And you look up the Greek, there's some other meanings. And one of the other meanings is a reappearing, a reappearance. And so when Christ was laid in the grave, on the third day, he was resurrected or he reappeared or there was a reappearing a day is like a thousand years a thousand years like a day well we've been a couple thousand years or in other words in God's economy two days since the resurrection we are entering the third day just food for thought, a reappearing, a reappearance. Make no mistake, we are in the last days. Well, how are we to look at that? Well, we believe he's coming again. As we observe the ordinance of communion this morning, it does say in that word, that we do this in remembrance of him until he comes again. We believe that these are the last days. If you know anything about scripture. But guess what? There's a work to be done. There's a work to be done. He said that the fields are ripe. There's a harvest to happen. There's a harvest that must come. So we need to get ready for it. You're going to see things in this year of 2022, 
in this church, as a result of this church, that you have never even thought about or never even imagined. But one of the things that needs to happen is we need to, to have our faith continually grow. Our faith grows by reading the word. Faith comes by hearing and hearing of the word of God. So today, I'm going to talk about something. I'm going to give you a lot of scripture, a lot of the word of God today. Now, these are not popular scriptures that I'm going to give you today, but here's what I want you to keep in mind. I want you to keep in mind that all of the scripture that I'm going to give you today is from the New Testament, with the exception of one, which is from the Old Testament, and that's from the prophet Daniel. Make no mistake, the New Testament, as uh, in 1986, there were 24,000 known manuscripts of the New Testament that all said the same thing. So today, I think that 24,000 is probably up in the 60 to 70,000 manuscripts of the New Testament writings that we have in our Bible. So this is not, these are not fairy tales. These are letters that were written by, by uh, men that experienced the risen Christ. These are these are gospels these are eyewitness accounts the gospel of matthew mark luke and john they are eyewitness of accounts of men that were present during his three-year ministry on earth men that witnessed the reappearing or the resurrection men that witnessed the crucifixion men that witnessed the miraculous And so, what I'm going to show you today is how do we know that we are truly in the last days, and how do we know that the Word of God is real? Let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. The first book of the Bible that I ever read was the book of Job. <laughs> you know... <laughs> I wasn't encouraged. But that was the first book of the Bible that I ever read. That is actually the book of the Bible that I have done my most extensive study of. In the book of Job, there's a part where God confronts Job. And he starts asking Job questions because Job basically called God out. Because Job felt like God was dealing unfairly with him. And he called God out. So um, just to paraphrase, he said, you need to show yourself. You need to tell me why. Because I believe that you've been unjust as far as I'm concerned. And Job went on to tell God all of the great things that he did, how great he was, how righteous he was, and so on. And, and so God shows up, but he didn't really answer Job's question. What God did was he just began to question Job. And you're going to find this in there. One of the questions that God asked Job, he said, Job, have you been to the freshwater springs beneath the sea? That's what he said to Job. It was 1996 that a scientific expedition set out with a robotic submarine to go deeper in the ocean than we've ever been before, essentially to see what's down there. And this robotic submarine, it went down, I'm not sure how deep, I think something like over three miles. 
and it discovered freshwater springs in the bottom of the ocean. Now, you understand what I'm saying? This word is true. And everything is going according to plan. And we need not be discouraged. We need to be encouraged. Because it is every, we are every day closer to his imminent return. The Gospel of Luke, chapter 21, verses 25 through 28. Are we good, Ab? All right, here we go. And there will be signs in the sun and moon and stars, and upon the earth there will be distress, trouble and anguish of nations in bewilderment and perplexity, without resources left wanting, embarrassed in doubt, not knowing which way to turn at the roaring, the echo of the tossing of the sea. Men swooning away or expiring with fear and dread and apprehension and expectation of things that are coming on the world, for the very powers of the heavens will be shaken and caused to totter. And then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with great transcendent and overwhelming power and all his kingly glory, majesty, and splendor. And now when these things begin to occur, look up. Lift up your heads because your redemption, deliverance, is drawing near. I have no doubt in my mind that we're living in the last days. And the Word of God has much to say about the end times and what will happen in them. And sometimes we get into the book of Daniel or the book of Revelation and we try to figure things out and about uh, the time that we got it all figured out and we put our interpretation on it, something else happens. And we see that maybe our interpretation was not quite accurate or was wrong. But there's one thing you can be sure of. And this is what I call the foolproof scriptures. These are the things that Jesus said. These are the things that James, Peter, Paul, and the other New Testament writers who were inspired by the Holy Spirit, these are the things that they wrote about the last days. And so what we're going to do today is I'm going to go through some of these things. And if you're like me, and you think about it, you're going to be saying, how did they know? And that's the question. How did they know? Had to be God. The Bible says he knows the end from the beginning. There's no other way. I want you to notice in that last verse of the text that I read, Luke said, your redemption is drawing near. Now, some of you may say, well, I thought we were already redeemed. Well, we are uh, as far as our spirits are concerned, but there's also going to be a redemption of our body when Jesus comes. Now, I want to go to Romans 8, and I want you to take a look at the 23rd verse. And it says this, it says, And not only the creation, but we ourselves too, who have and enjoy the first fruits of the Holy Spirit. Do you hear that? We have the first fruits of the Spirit. You see, we have the Holy Spirit. In the new birth, we have the baptism of the Holy Spirit available to us, and we have the gifts of the Holy Spirit. I don't care what anybody tells you, the gifts of the Holy Spirit are alive and well, and living 
in the churches that have experienced the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Let me read 23. I didn't read the whole thing. Let me, let me, let me do it again. Here's what it says. It says, And not only the creation, but we ourselves too, who have and enjoy the first fruits of the Holy Spirit, a foretaste of the blissful things to come grown inwardly, as we wait for the redemption of our bodies. You hear that? Redemption from what? From sensuality and the grave, which will reveal our adoption, our manifestation as God's plan. Now this is talking about the signs of the times we live in. Things that shall come to pass in the last days when our redemption shall be consummated and our body shall be redeemed. Another example is in James. In James chapter 5, verses 1 through 5, listen to this. Come now, you rich people. Weep aloud and lament over the miseries, the woes that are surely coming upon you. Your abundant wealth has rotted and is ruined, and your many garments have become moth-eaten. Your gold and silver are completely rusted through, and their rust will be testimony against you, and it will devour your flesh as if it were fire. You have heaped together treasure for the last days. Hoarded wealth, if you would, all right? But look, here are the wages that you have withheld by fraud from the laborers who have reaped your fields, crying out for vengeance and the cries of the harvesters who have come to the ears of the Lord of hosts. Here on earth you have abandoned yourselves to soft, prodigal living and to the pleasures of self-indulgence and self-gratification you have fattened your hearts in a day of slaughter. <coughs> James identifies this hoarded wealth. King James says heaped up treasure. This is one of the signs of the last days. Do you realize today, when you look at the rich and famous, do you realize how much money these billionaires have this is like never before in history there are men worth more than countries today true how did James know that how did he know that well God had to tell him at the time James wrote this letter they didn't have the New Testament in the form that we have it today. They just had letters that were written to the church. Now, James, not knowing what Paul wrote, well, he spoke, he spoke something which would happen in the last days about this heaped-up treasure. And Paul, not knowing what James wrote, also talked about the last days. I want you to notice what Paul says in 2 Timothy 3, 1 and 2. Now, keep in mind, Paul was not talking about the church and what would happen in it. He's talking about what would happen in the world in the last days. 2 Timothy 3, 1 and 2. But understand this, that in the last days will come set in perilous times, of great stress and trouble, hard to deal with and hard to bear. For people will be lovers of self and utterly self-centered, lovers of money and aroused by an inordinate, greedy desire for wealth, proud and arrogant and contemptuous boasters. They will be abusive, blasphemous, scoffing, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, and profane. They will be without natural human affection, callous and inhuman. 
relentless, admitting of no truce or appeasement. They will be slanderers, false accusers, troublemakers, intemperate and loose in morals and conduct, uncontrolled and fierce haters of good. In my whole life, I've never seen the disobedience to parents that I've seen in the last 20 years. When I was young, even, even people that were unchurched, even people that didn't go to church had respect for their parents. Or they'd get a lick of it. But you see, this is a sign of the last days. 2 Timothy 3, 3 through 5. They will be without natural human affection, callous and inhuman, relentless, admitting of no truce or appeasement. They will be slanderers, false accusers, troublemakers, intemperate, and loosen morals and conduct, uncontrolled and fierce, haters of good. They will be treacherous betrayers, rash and inflated with self-conceit. They will be lovers of sensual pleasures, pleasures with vain amusements more than and rather than lovers of God. For although they hold a form of piety, true religion, they deny and reject and are strangers to the power of it. Their conduct belies the genuineness, genuineness of their profession. Avoid all such people. Turn away from them. Now this says, there'll be, uh, King James says there'll be a form of godliness, but denying the power. I've never really been able to understand some people that have been in the charismatic circles. What I mean by, by what I'm saying is, you know, they'll get born again. They'll get filled with the Holy Spirit. They'll get healed by the power of God, and then they'll just go to some old dead church that doesn't believe in the whole Bible. These churches right here in the United States, they, they tell them that speaking with tongues and that healing, that healing business, they say, well, that's of the devil. They only have a form of godliness, denying its power. And the scripture plainly says what? Have nothing to do with them. It doesn't say to go join up with them. It says... From such turn away. That's in King James translation. Furthermore, it's kind of beyond my comprehension that spirit-filled people will, would, would, would invest into a work like that. I know people who do. They say, well, Mama and, 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 and Grandma, they were members of that church. You know, it, it doesn't, matter where, doesn't matter where I go, you know, just as long as I go. No, that's not true. That's not true. You know, there was a guy that uh, the house that our son bought on Mount Hope Ave in uh, Rockaway, it was owned by a, a man by the name of George Fichter. And uh, George Fichter was a, uh, he was a, a guy, he, he, well, I was, I was uh, 30-something when I met George. George was 90-something. And George would go from house to house with his Bible. He wasn't a witness, a Jehovah witness, but he would go from house to house with his Bible, and he would share the gospel. And he came, and he shared the gospel with me. One of the things that he told me, he says, Oh, Kenny, he says, don't read that Bible. You've got to read the King James. That's the only authorized version. <laughs> yeah. But anyhow... He told me that in days gone by, when him and his wife were young, they only had a part-time uh, they only had part-time preaching at this Baptist church in Dover, 
And that's the church that he went to. It was the first Baptist church in Dover, New Jersey. He said, but they always had a Saturday night service. He said, we had that whether we had a preacher or not. One of the deacons or one of the Sunday school teachers or somebody else would conduct the service. And George told me, he says, you know, in those days, he says, in the Baptist church, he said, on that Saturday night, we always had time that we called it a, a testimony time. And people would stand up and they would testify about what God had done for them and how he, how he had heard and answered prayer. He said that Saturday evening uh, meeting, he said that was always packed. And he said the power of God would fall and people would shout up and down the aisles. And when the service was over uh, and, they, and you were walking home, and he said, and some of them came in wagons, he says, we could hear people shouting and praising God five to ten blocks away. Now, they weren't Pentecostals. They weren't full gospel people. They weren't crazy, I mean, charismatics. <laughs> they were Baptists. They were Methodists. They were disciples of Christ. And, the Christ and, and, and Christian church members, they knew something about the power of God and the move of the Spirit. But in, in, in this day and age, somebody gets up and shouts in some of the mainline denominational churches and they'll throw them out. saying, hey, we've got a form we go by. And we don't allow things like that. So many churches have a form of godliness denying its power, and that's one of the things that's talked about in the last days. Paul said to Timothy, he said, from such turn away. But mark this, there will be terrible times in the last day. Paul said, we're living in that time. Now notice what Jesus says in Luke 17. Luke 17, 28 through 30. So also, it was the same as it was in the days of Lot. People ate, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built. But on the very day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. And that is the way it will be on the day that the Son of Man is revealed. You see, before Jesus comes, it'll be as it was in the days of Lot. What happened then? It said, well, people were eating and drinking. Well, you've never seen so many eating and drinking places as we have today. I mean, and they keep building more. People were eating and drinking. They were buying and selling. They were planting and building. Kind of sounds like today, doesn't it? What's another sign of the times uh, and the day in which we live? Look at Luke 21, 25. And there will be signs in the sun and moon and stars and upon the earth there will be distress. Trouble and anguish of nations in bewilderment and perplexity without resources left wanting, embarrassed in doubt, not knowing which way to turn at the roaring, the echo of the tossing of the sea. Now, I want you to understand something. You can't understand that kind of translation unless you understand the Bible. When it talks about the roaring and the tossing of the sea, I want you to know that that's, that represents people. You see, water is also a type of the Holy Spirit. What causes anguish and perplexity of nations? It's the roaring and tossing of the sea. It means that the people of the earth are in upheaval. And we're there. And heads of nations, they don't know what to do. They can't find the answers. Now, Luke goes on in 26 and 27 to say, Men swooning away or expiring with fear and dread and apprehension and expectation of things that are coming on the world. For the very 
powers of the heavens will be shaken and caused to totter. And then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with great transcendent and overwhelming power and all his kingly glory, majesty, and splendor. The stress of nations, that's a, that's a sign of the last days. Now, I'm going to go over to Matthew, and I want you to see what Jesus said about the last days in Matthew. Matthew 24 and 6. He says this, And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not frightened or troubled. Ever since World War II, we've heard of wars and rumors of wars. There's been constant fighting. Now the verse continues. For this must take place. But the end is not yet. What things must happen? Wars and rumors of wars must happen. Jesus said, this must take place. But the end is still to come. Look what verse 7 says. Verse 7 says, For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines and earthquakes in place after place. You heard anything about famines anywhere? Heard anything about earthquakes? Heard anything about earthquakes in various places? Now listen to the eighth verse. All this is but the beginning. The early pains of the birth pangs of the intolerable anguish. King James says this, all these are the beginning of sorrows. See, this passage here, it's another foolproof sign of the time in which we live. It doesn't need any interpretation. Now, 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 3, we find this. To begin with, You must know and understand this, that scoffers, mockers will come in the last days with scoffing. People who walk after their own fleshly desires. Well, what are they scoffing at? You find the answer in verse 4. And say, where is the promise of his coming? Who's coming? Jesus is coming. For since the forefathers fell asleep, all things have continued exactly as they did from the beginning of creation in other words peter says there would be those who would mock and scoff at the visible return of the lord jesus christ well guess what we've got them on every hand it's another sign of the times in the second chapter of second peter we read another sign of the end times can you read the signs you see that's what they're for look at second Peter chapter 2 and verse 1. Simon Peter, a servant and apostle, special messenger of Jesus Christ, to those... No, I'm, I'm in the wrong one. Chapter 2 and verse 1. All right. But also in those days... There arose false prophets among the people. Did you hear that? I want you to see something here. When Peter says there shall be false prophets, King James says false teachers among you, he means right among the people of God. Now that passage continues. You got to be careful who you listen to. You got to be careful what you listen to. Now watch. That passage continues. It says, "Who will subtly and stealthily introduce heretical doctrines, destructive heresies, 
even denying and disowning the master who bought them, bringing upon themselves swift destruction. And many will follow their immoral ways and lascivious doings. Because of them, the true way will be maligned and defamed. And in their covetousness, lust, greed, they will exploit you with false, cunning arguments. From of old, the sentence of condemnation for them has not been idle. Their destruction, eternal misery, has not been asleep. False teachers. There's also predictions about terrorist groups, immorality, and, and crime waves. Second Timothy 3 and 1 says this. It says, This know also, that in the last days perilous times shall come. Now that means there are terrible times. It's no wonder at all that in these last days terrorist groups have risen. Paul said there would be terrible times. I want you to notice there's a prediction of a crime wave in this passage. Watch this, 2 Timothy 3, 2 and 3, watch. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous boasters, proud blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truth breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce despisers of those that are good. You know what Paul's talking about when he's saying without natural affection? He's talking about homosexuals and lesbians. They're without natural affection. It's unnatural for a man to want a man. It's unnatural for a woman to want a woman. He says they are without natural affections. Turning back to Romans, you'll find that Paul discussed that subject as well. Romans chapter 1 and verse 26, he says this. He says, for this reason, God gave them over and abandoned them to vile affections and degrading passions. For their women exchanged their nat natural function for an unnatural and abnormal one. King James says this, it says, For this cause God gave them up unto vile affections, for even their women did change the natural use into which is against nature. It's against nature. It's not natural for a woman to want a woman. Look at uh, verse 27. And men also turned from natural relations with women and were set ablaze, burning out, consumed with lust for one another, men committing shameful acts with men, and suffering in their own bodies and personalities the inevitable consequences and penalty of their wrongdoing and going astray, which was their fitting retribution. Notice that Paul is saying that in the last days, among the other things that he listed, there's going to be a rise in homosexuality. Have we seen it in our day? Certainly we've seen it, but let me just tell you something. Well, doesn't God love homosexuals and lesbians? Yes, he does. God loves all sinners. But he doesn't love the sin. But I want to make something clear. In God's economy, there's no degree of sin. Sin is sin. So someone that's practicing a homosexual lifestyle is practicing sin. Someone that has a judgmental spirit in them is practicing sin. There's no difference. And so all are welcome. All are welcome because... We trust that God knows what he's doing. 
I wish that God would invite all manner of sinners into this house because they would sit under the word. What I'm giving you today may not be glamorous. <laughs> it may not be catchy. It may be boring, but it's the word. And God says, my word shall go forth. And it shall accomplish the purpose for which I sent it. It shall not return void. And someone that comes in here, regardless of, 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 of who they are, what they practice, what they believe, if they sit under the word of God, God will touch them. He will touch them. He touched me. He changed me. It was his word that did it. The Bible says that God hates sin. But he sent Jesus to redeem everybody. He says that I wish that all would be saved including homosexuals, including those puffed up with pride, including you, including me. And he'll take those lives and he'll turn them around. But what Paul is saying is that there's going to be an increase of these things in the last days. In our own country, we can certainly see it, can't we? And here's the big problem. The big problem is, is that you have churches that are putting people in blatant sin in the pulpit. Now, that's not to say that I'm an angel. I'm just an old sinner saved by grace. But if and when I commit a willful sin, the Holy Spirit's all over me. I mean, he's like, and like, I'm like, oh, God. You, you get what I'm saying? But someone in willful sin for a church to put in the pulpit, God loves the sinner, but he hates the sin. There's not going to be an anointing. There's not going to be the power or presence of God because they're preaching out of a book other than the book. Praying form prayers. Following liturgies that Again, a form of religion, but no power. I'm out of time today. I'm going to pick this up in a couple of weeks. And here's the thing. Knowing what we know and knowing what the Word of God says, we need to get our lives in order. We need to get our lives in order with regards to him. We need to, we need to get serious with God. We need to be reading the word. Amen. We need to be in prayer, in regular prayer. And we need to be asking God to put his love in our hearts because it is our job to love. The Holy Spirit's job to convict not the church's job, the Holy Spirit's job, and God's job to judge. Father God, I thank you for your word. I thank you, God, that you don't leave us without instruction. And I just pray, God, that your word would bear on our hearts, Lord. I pray, Lord, that we would get serious with you, Lord. I pray, God, that you would give everyone here Increase time to read your word. Increase time to 
be in communication with you. Increase time to love on somebody the way Jesus loved on them. Bless your people, I ask and pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If anybody needs prayer, just come on up front here and somebody would be so honored to pray with you. God bless you.